Today I'm here in Annadale at one of these places that burned last year. I'm on this slope. This used to be a manzanita tree right here behind me. And you can see a lot of burnt trees and bushes. And at the same time, you can see how much verdant regrowth there is. If you've had a recent traumatic experience with wildfire or have experienced any type of trauma around fire, just be advised that I will show some burned areas of vegetation in this video and be talking about fire. You can see back there behind me, that whole ridge line, that whole area that burnt all last year, and the fire came over from there and came over here, came into this park. You can see many of these trees right here burned. This understory all burned. A lot of the, there would have been a lot of ground fuel, so um, different leaves and dry branches and stuff on the ground here that all burnt. And it really opened up a lot of area. You can see these manzanitas here um, died. At least the above ground part is dead. They might re sprout from the base. This is the first year, so a lot of those woody plants don't. Um, come back in that in the first spring following a burn but you can see the herbaceous plants on the other hand are, are loving it and making huge comeback tons of this death camas uh, beautiful lily lily family plant you can see the poison oak coming back right there lots of that look at how big the soap root the soap root grows back really happy after this fire comes through and you can see this oak totally survived. Speaking of oak, that sounded like an oak titmouse. Or wait, no, there's some kind of warblers over there. Oh, cool. Um, but you can see that this, this was a pretty good fire through here. It killed, it looks like it, no, it didn't even kill those little bays, but it opened up the space and a lot of the plants, California natives were covering really nicely in here. There's less of this understory than there was before, which means it will be less susceptible to high intensity fires in the future. But look at how it, this area has really opened up and there are still a lot of these non-native annual grasses coming back. It, but even those, look at how bright green and verdant they look. There are some areas you can see there where nothing is really coming back very much right now. Um, some stuff though, that means the seeds could have all been killed, but um, some stuff, or there might have been less seeds in those areas because they were so covered with duff. Some stuff will come back from underground storage organs in those areas. Up ahead we'll see some of the cool California native wildflowers that like to come back from those areas. Oh, like look at this right here. I think this is the checker lily. What a beautiful flower. So I'll get a nature journal, some of those soon. You can see there's um, more of this soap root, really loving it in these burnt areas, coming back real nicely. This whole slope right here, you can see some of these dug firs did die. Um, and this area probably was a little bit more thickly forested, not super healthy. Um, and I think the burn through a lot of this was actually pretty good from an ecological standpoint. There are gonna be some dead trees in that area that they'll need to remove, um, could be hazardous. And you can see there is potential, some of these places for some more erosion um, now that there's less cover. This charcoal right here is going to be carbon in the soil for a long, long time to come. Um, you can see there's this also this interesting, I think it's a fungus um, that grows here, oftentimes on the charcoal. Sort of forming a little bit of a protective layer there. There's definitely some hazard trees like this one. You can see broke um, near the base. Um, even though it might not have fallen over in the fire, it did fall shortly after that. So when nature journaling or just hiking in these kind of areas, you have to be aware of those things. Um, and you can see an overall really nice verdant layer of regrowth um, in this area that had the fire come through it completely. Look at these milkmaids, one of the California native wildflowers here, um, coming back really nicely through this whole area. 
probably benefiting from the openness um, created by that fire fire speeding up a lot of the nutrient cycling so a lot of the organic matter held in the trees is more easily returned to the soil through ashes and um, that's one of the reasons why slash and burn agriculture has been one of the main ways that humans have grown food for for um, much of our time as agriculturalists on this planet and it's definitely a quick way to get a lot of nutrients back into the soil look at that tree that snag right there um, one thing to remember is dead trees and things like that that look like trash to us are actually habitat for a lot of animals so when a fire comes through and partially kills a lot of things that's an important factor to remember is that there is habitat there so just because it's standing dead tree doesn't mean it needs to be removed it is serving um it can serve as important habitat up here there's some more cool um california wildflowers that are really loving this burnt area you can see the california buttercup oh wow yeah this is great california buttercup in here as well as the shooting star um right here coming up really nicely lots of that and um i think that's the fremont's death camis right there so um really cool one and you can see all of these right here i believe these fleshy leaves are more of the shooting stars so this this zone right here is just going to be covered completely covered in those shooting stars there's a few more in here that i'm not totally sure about but definitely that death camis right there shooting stars and um the buttercups really nice look at the way the wildflowers are responding here there's tons of shooting stars the um the soap root definitely loves it and look at this death camas it's like just a huge field of death camas over here oh and i think i see some kind of delphinium or larkspur or something like that um super cool let's go check that out and then i'm gonna start nature journaling this stuff because it is awesome out here oh i see some buckeye um re-sprouting um the above ground part of the tree looked like it burned a lot but look at that some kind of larkspur or delphinium right there um that is really cool look at that this one was not opened up yet when i came out here before oh yeah what a beautiful plant um, often that characteristic foliage down there there's a lot of this coming up i need to watch out for poison oak though because there's so much poison oak in here um this death camas is not a big deal as long as you don't eat it but it is very poisonous um but also just a beautiful oh look at that man root cucurbitaceae right there there are non-native plants coming up in here too oh look at that yarrow getting ready to flower oh uh, yeah this is great this is so cool and i had been in this area not right before the burn but had been in here, in here before and it was not it did not seem this um floristically pumping um before i think there was some diversity here but this just looks like it's really really coming back in a nice way these ferns are coming back um there's ferns there's snowberry there's um I, I naturalist some of these other plants, but I'll, I'm, I'm gonna draw some of these and try to do a little collection of these post burn plants here. Um, a lot of these could have been waiting in the seed bank, so their seeds could have just been waiting um, until um, the fire came through and or more sunlight. Um, and some of these things also could have been um, spread. The seeds might have um, spread out here before, but here's a perfect example. Look at the way that tree fell. I think I'm gonna nature journal that. Look at the way that tree fell right there and just opened up this space that would have otherwise been so much more shaded. Oh, here's a California honeysuckle coming up right there. There are definitely a lot of non-native annual grasses. Um, and I see like cleavers and some of these other um, non-natives as well that are probably gonna be, you know, competing in here. But um, I think overall this fire looks like in a lot of ways was beneficial in um, this zone right here of Annadale Park. This oak tree looks pretty dead, this California live oak. But when you look up, look at those new sprouts on it. It's 
definitely not dead yet. So, I'm here in this burn zone. You can see that there's a lot of stuff going on here. What nature journaling technique do you think would be best for nature journaling in this area today? How should I start? Should I do a curiosity wander? Doing a curiosity wander would definitely be really easy. I could just walk around here and bounce from one thing to another. Like, look at the regrowth of that bay right there. That California bay, completely dead above ground and re-sprouting from the base. I could walk around and just find tons of stuff like that to Nature Journal. Look at the death camas, how much death camas is blooming around here. It's even more back there. Look at the way the poison oak is regrowing. It is some of the healthiest looking poison oak I have ever seen. Some of them have the biggest leaves of poison oak that I've ever seen in my life. Should I Nature Journal that? There's just so many choices. I could do a collection. I could do a collection of things regrowing that looked dead, that were regrowing. I could do a collection of flowers because there are so many things flowering here right now. Let me just show you one of my favorites while I avoid stepping on poison oak. Look at this thing growing out of the rock right there. That is amazing. There is so much life here in this area that just burnt last fall. Look at that, beautiful, beautiful. So you don't have to be a genius to see that there is something about fires that creates a lot of fertility for plants or creates a very healthy plant growth response. Look at this, look at these oak seedlings right here. These are oak seedlings and they are some of the healthiest looking seedlings I have seen in a long time. And look at that poison oak right there. That is just ridiculous. So fire is a lot of times associated with destruction, but we have to, right now, we can see the narrative about fire is definitely changing in the parts of the world where we have forgotten what that is. And I think that's really important. Um, and there's just so many things to Nature Journal here today. What I think I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start with a big picture. Um, capturing the topography of the zone that I'm in because this topography had a big impact on the way the fire moved through here and then I'm going to just start zeroing in from there and getting to a smaller and smaller scale and maybe ending with nature journaling about all this moss because this area had so much moss on all these rocks and growing on a rock is very different um, I'm imagining than from growing in the soil when a fire comes through and even the rock here is all a different color. I'm glad that you're here with me on this video, getting this experience and this adventure. Whoa, I think that was, that looks like it was, um, look at how it's wilting though. It grew so fast and so quickly, that vegetative burst that it's now wilting in this sun and this is quite a microclimate here in these rocks this would be a great place for some type of reptiles to overwinter like rattlesnakes or something they i don't know how they would have fared in the fire you can see here this is i think this is the mimulus the sticky monkey flower and um these are the branches that of it before that got burnt and died oh that looks like clematis right there almost looks like a grapevine that's probably what was growing all the way up here before. So you can see um, this is all the burnt part. And that is it down there growing again. And you can see that one has opposite leaves. So even if you weren't sure about the species, you could look at the opposite leaves and then notice and infer that this dead one up here has opposite leaves as well. So that's how I know it's not poison oak. But wow, there's just infinite things to geek out on here. And I kind of just want to run around and talk about them and look at them. Oh, there's a ton of bumblebees. I wonder if they're going to the man root or if they're going to the um, death camas. Because I'm curious what pollinators go to the death camas. Oh, yeah, I would love to. Oh, look at that. There's a surfid fly on that death camas right there. Oh. Okay, so I saw a surfid fly. I saw some type of bumblebee. And I really want to pay attention to what other pollinators are out here. It's kind of tricky walking around. This is so cool. Oh my god. It's like a playground here. Nature journaling playground. You have to be careful though 
um, walking around not to cause too much disturbance. Oh, look at that man root. Starting to form fruit right there. Oh man. Look at that. Man root. Not the coolest name ever for a plant. This one also another mimulus there regrowing the dead part the new part it's growing back pretty fast where is that poison oak? i think that's the po look at that poison oak right there that's the one that is just crazy the craziest poison oak plant i've ever seen okay all right let's do this all right to capture the topography here which is the big picture most important fire variable to capture this topography i'm going to do sort of like a, a landscape ito version and maybe i'll do a diagram version also of how to capture that topography so what i'm seeing right here is this foreground that's sort of almost like a sloped valley then it gets steeper right there where the rocks are but it's still maintaining this slope coming across the side. And all of these trees right here, the above ground is completely burnt on them, except for some of these big ones. And then in the background there, I can see um, in the distance, a bunch of large burnt, a large burnt area of um, like Douglas firs or redwoods, some type of conifers. So this is what I have so far, and um, look how easy that drawing is. It's not much of a landscape ito to tell you the truth, but sort of in between a landscape ito and a diagram. And then I used writing really as a quick way to capture some of this information that's important for getting the overall picture of this area that burned. Now I think I'm gonna move um, and um, put in my metadata and not step in any of this poison oak. Hopefully, gosh, cause like, hey, poison oak, it's okay, it's okay. So I'm gonna come over here to do my metadata. Looks like the poison oak really liked this area here. So one thing that's likely to happen if you're nature journaling in a burn zone is, um, you're gonna get charcoal on your hands and then that's gonna end up on your paper. So it's good if for situations like this, you have a fault tolerant style of nature journaling. So if your nature journaling style is fault tolerant, a little bit of charcoal on your paper is not gonna mess anything up too badly. If your nature journaling style is not fault tolerant, maybe you have like really precise pencil work that takes a long time and is really pale and really delicate that or that requires you to be in a very stable position when you're sitting there um, those are the kinds of things that is going to make it harder to nature journal in the field um, especially in situations that are sort of like dirty or ashy or charcoaly or anything like that i'm gonna put my color into my diagram here first though a fault tolerant style for me is um, pretty broad, quick ink strokes and um, larger lines, larger marks, and um, quick watercolor, usually like one wash if possible, um, sometimes two, but that can be done fast enough and it's bold enough that if I get extraneous marks or mistakes on the paper, um, or things fall on the paper or whatever, fingerprints, it's not gonna ruin my page. And also it's not impossible to do it in the field. And if I make mistakes with my drawing tools, it also is not that big a deal. All right, now I'm gonna go ahead and add that metadata that I mentioned before. If you've watched my show before, then you know what metadata is, hopefully. If not, that's even better because you get to learn right now. 
So metadata is basically just the above information, the around information, the contextual information, and whatever is important for you um, should be, or is important for that particular situation should be added. And I'm just gonna, I'm not gonna probably do the most scientific example of it right now, but basically what you wanna have is um, location and you wanna have time. So your location in space and time and then also like climate conditions, you know, what is the weather like? Um, that should be pretty easy today, so I'm not even gonna draw a cloud on my paper, um, which I sometimes do. And you could have the temperature, you could have the relative humidity, those are two basic quantitative um, climate conditions that are really useful metadata. Um, so if you carry something around for that, and try to think of some other things that would be relevant information for you. And the reason the metadata is important is because it makes it so that you can look these things up later, for example, um, and have it connected to, to when it was. You might be curious, what would this place look like? What if I want a nature journal in this place again next year, right at the same time? That would be really important information. And also like the climate and the weather and the time of year are all connected to the types of things you might be seeing. So like when do um, the death camas flower and when do the soap root flower? Well, the soap root flower definitely aren't flowering right now and the death camas definitely is. So having a date associated with those events um, is super cool. So I'm gonna go ahead and put that in now. You can make your metadata fun too if you want. You can leave spaces for things you might need to research later. One good thing to know for metadata is this approximate sign. I often use that. Um, I pr try to always use that if I'm guessing temperature. It's basically perfect temperature right now, in my opinion. Um, not a single cloud in the sky. I haven't gotten good at remembering the Beaufort um, wind scale yet, um, unfortunately, but I'll try to at least make some type of um, qualitative measurement of the wind. And remember, don't let not knowing, oh, there's a raven carrying something up there. Shoot, lost it. Dang it, didn't see what that raven was carrying. iCloud, and then um, I'm gonna just say, ooh, bird calls. Um, so I just created this really simple metadata right here. You can see, la la la. Um, a little bit of almost like a landscapeito there showing the wind, gentle breeze sun not a cloud in the sky so you don't have to be you know super if if you know you don't have to be super scientific about it but at least just getting something on there is really helpful um i probably should have left space for um like a title up here um i didn't do that and it would be really squeezing to put it in um, but one thing i mentioned now is marginalia i love this concept so create a space where if you know you hear a bird or something um, or maybe thoughts come into your mind that you want to put down, just create this space over here where you can do that. Um, and I'm guessing that bird down, I think that was um, an oak tit mouse. Here's some other things now too. Okay, so I got that, I got that. Now I'm ready to keep going with whatever basically interests me. So I have the beginning of a page here. I've just been working on drawing this bay tree or getting a diagram of this bay tree on my page, showing the way that it's characteristically has its branches twisted, um, indicating the direction that the fire was traveling in. Um, you can see how they're all pointing up and to the left and that they get kind of swept into that pattern and will crisp into that pattern. This one next to it is also um, 
noticeably that way. And that coincides with the terrain direction. So um, I'm probably gonna draw an arrow in the background there to parallel the arrow down here. Um, and I just measured the, um, the growth, which is about 20 centimeters. And you can see the above ground part looks totally dead. The bark is blistering and peeling off um, completely. Um, and uh, looks quite quite dead above ground. But look at how alive it is um, and how it is re-sprouting. Re and look at the coloration in there is, is really cool to see as well. A lot of times new growth on plants, these kind of shoots um, have a different chemical composition than the um, older growth or the more established growth. I'm just trying to be really careful about the poison up here. And um, sometimes um, they're also important food for animals. So look in here and you'll notice that many of these have been broken off. Do you see that? And I think it's unlikely that these were all broken off by accident. Oh, that's an old one, huh, interesting. Um, but look at these ones are also broken off right there. These have been broken off and they're not quite broken off. They're more cut off and you'll notice that it's quite a noticeable edge there um, and all on the same side. So I think this is serving as food for something. Another really important reminder about how there is a different mixture of food resources for animals in an area that is in this stage of succession. So returning from a disturbance event such as a fire and um, that can actually create more biodiversity because the places that are in this stage um, are feeding different animals than the places that are in like a more established um, or forested stage. So in all of those different stages from disturbance until like a so-called climax um, community, all of those stages um, feed different animals in different ways. And so if everything were in a climax community, then there wouldn't be as many types of um, resources for different types of animals. There's some kind of cool bird flying over there. Okay, so I captured that. Now I'm gonna start zooming in on some um, individual plants. All right, so there's a lot of cool flowering plants around me right now. I'm super excited because I set up the GoPro next to some flowers and I think I'm gonna get some footage of some bees close up. There's some cool California native bees, bumblebee looking bees here that I'm really excited to learn more about and I'm going to be looking at some of these flowers too and um, adding some basic plant and animal stuff to my page oh there that there maybe it's a fly it might be a um some type of hoverfly they don't stay in one place for very long though okay That would be a good thing to add into my marginalia, perhaps. All right, and then I think I will add basic basic drawing of the um, death camis. Hard to get into position here on these rocks. Um, how can I do a representation showing that there's tons of it? Oh, there's one of those flies again. Oh, come on, come back. I'm really slow with um, my binoculars when I'm using sunglasses. It's annoying. I haven't found a good solution. If anyone knows a solution for balancing sunglasses and binoculars, um, without taking a long time going back and forth, please let me know. Especially when you're nature journaling. I need to be able to do it with one hand. It has to be a one hand operation. Because now my eyes are just getting blasted by the paper. Okay. 
these might not be the best for that. Okay, I think I've seen at least, um, I'm gonna try to get a bumblebee depiction here. I know that there's one that is, um, all dark. What is it? All dark and then all light? Or all light and then dark. And then I think there might be one that's all dark too. Just 100% dark. Oh, there was one. That one looked kind of like a carpenter bee, almost all dark. Oh, that one's, that's a surfed fly. Oops. How to simplify a really friggin' complicated flower and just kind of make it up as you go. <laughs> Oops, that was five. It's supposed to be six. That's actually important. Some things, being able to make some things up is fine, but like with this flower, it needs to be six petals for sure. Um, not five so I'm just gonna maybe leave it almost like at that um, there's some sort of buds that have not opened up yet and it's forming these clusters all right that's a simplification but I think that's gonna work um, and then I'm gonna write uh, I think it's the it's oh man what is the name oh it's uh, it's not toxicodendron because that's what um that's what poison oak is. So I'm just gonna write the common name. That's fine. Maybe I can do a cool kind of just Fermi number guess, order of magnitude guess on how many uh, how many of them there are around here. <laughs> Look at how many there. There's a ton. Um, but like that's it. practicing quantification is is super useful. Um, so I'm just going to, and I don't do it enough, so I'm going to think, how can I, well, I'm going to count, um, flower stalks, not, um, individual flowers. So let me count, like, this area right here, one, two, three, four, five, six, nine, ten, get an idea of what ten looks like. Okay, so ten, twenty, thirty, um, forty, fifty, sixty. All right, now I have an idea of what 100 looks like. So let's see. Uh, 100, 200, 300, 400, 500, 600, 700, 800. So I'm going to guess. I'm going to guess a um, thousand. And so when you're guessing too, like your order of magnitude should determine, like, or your your degree of certainty should determine what um what uh, like decimal place you go down to and so if if i'm guessing counting by the hundreds i'm not going to say like 1000 uh you know 532 i'm going to just round it keep it pretty round so i'm just guessing somewhere around a thousand on this particular hill um and just practicing guessing over and over again is not necessarily going to actually make you more accurate. So sometimes you have to do counting too. <laughs> and guess and then count. Um, and I'm just gonna say plants, uh, or I'm gonna say flowering. That's assuming individuals, which is questionable in a plant that probably does a lot of vegetative propagation. Flowering. So I'll put question mark next to individuals. Lots of uncertainty in that little note-taking segment. Now if I could only get a close-up for a moment, if I could only get a close-up on one of these bugs, um, but instead what I'll do is I'll just draw this. There is a, I believe it's a blue dick, and I'm blanking on the Latin name for those two. It's like, 
it used to be in one genus and now it's in a different genus. There's multiple related ones. Oh, 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 really cool butterfly just flew by. Awesome. So I'm gonna go ahead and draw that um, blue dick. So I'm adding stuff to that marginalia zone over here. Very useful zone to have. Um, and my page is almost full. I didn't do a proper title, which is not ideal. Oh, look at that. Some kind of cool parasitoid wasp thing. Oh, look at that. It's on my hand. There it is. Cool. Slow down so I can draw you. It's definitely getting windier and I got some good nature journaling in up here showing the death camas, a couple other plants and I did get my, uh, added a little bit to my marginalia where I was putting down other stuff that I was noticing about like insects. For example, now I wanna get another plant. There is this super cool plant up here. I think it is a larkspur or delphinium. Um, beautiful plant and I'm definitely gonna have to do some nature journaling here because this one was not flowering last time I was here. What an awesome plant. So I'm gonna nature journal these lovely flowers right here. So cool. And try to capture the different stages of growth on them in my nature journal. All right, I got a little bit of nature journaling in, basically a plant profile, and I'm gonna leave some space up at the top for a title. I think I'm gonna use that space to title both, both sides of the page, um, and mention something about the post fire area up there at the top, and then down there at the bottom, I'll probably put the species name because I haven't looked this one up yet. Um, and I can't remember if it's a delphinium or a larkspur. I think delphinium is a genus, um, but I always get these sort of mixed up with like columbines and stuff like that. So I'm going to look these up on iNaturalist later and add that. So basically, um, I filled two pages and um, covered a good amount of material, I think, for the area. Um, had fun, discovered some different stuff, and I think I've been here for a little more than an hour. Um, or I've been here close to two hours and have done this nature journaling. So thanks for joining along on this little nature journaling adventure. I hope to do more nature journaling in some of these interesting uh, post burn areas in the future. Um, there's a lot of cool wildflowers coming up right now in California. Tons of cool wildflowers. This is only just the beginning and they're often really showy in these um, regrowth areas and do really well in these regrowth areas. So I'm gonna be doing some more of that. And if you're new to the channel, be sure to subscribe, subscribe to the channel. And if you can't wait all the way until next week for the next episode of the show, check out these videos here. Bye.